Chapter One, Part Two, of What Men Live By. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What Men Live By, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by L and A Maud. Chapter One, Part Two day by day and week by week the year went round michael lived and worked with simon his fame spread till people said that no one sewed boots so neatly and strongly as simon's workman michael and from all the district round people came to simon for their boots and he began to be well off one winter day as simon and michael sat working a carriage on sledge runners with three horses and with bells drew up to the hut they looked out of the window the carriage stopped at their door a fine servant jumped down from the box and opened the door a gentleman in fur coat got out and walked up to simon's hut up jumped matryona and opened the door wide the gentleman stooped to enter the hut and when he drew himself up again his head neatly reached the ceiling and he seemed quite to fill his end of the room simon rose bowed and looked at the gentleman with astonishment he had never seen any one like him simon himself was lean michael was thin and matryona was dry as a bone but this man was like some one from another world red-faced burly with neck like a bull's and looking altogether as if he were cast in iron the gentleman puffed threw off his fur coat sat down on the bench and said which of you is the master bootmaker i am your excellency said simon coming forward the gentleman shouted to his lad hey fetka bring the leather the servant ran in bringing a parcel the gentleman took the parcel and put it on the table untie it said he the lad untied it the gentleman pointed to the leather look here shoemaker said he do you see this leather yes your honour but do you know what sort of leather it is simon felt the leather and said it is good leather good indeed why you fool you never saw such a leather before in your life it's german and it cost twenty roubles simon was frightened and said where should i ever see leather like that just so now can you make it into boots for me yes your excellency i can the gentleman shouted at him you can can you well remember whom you are to make them for and what the leather is you must make me boots that will wear for a year neither losing shape nor coming unsewn if you can do it take the leather and cut it up but if you can't say so i warn you now if your boots come unsewn or lose shape within a year i will have you put in prison if they don't burst or lose shape for a year i will pay you 10 roubles for your work simon was frightened and did not know what to say he glanced at michael and nudging him with his elbow whispered shall i take the work michael nodded his head as if to say yes take it simon did as michael advised and undertook to make boots that would not lose shape for split for a whole year calling his servant the gentleman told him to pull the boot off his left leg which he stretched out take my measure said he simon stitched a paper measure seventeen inches long smoothed it out knelt down wiped his hand well on his apron so as not to soil the gentleman's sock and began to measure he measured the sole and round the instep and began to measure the calf of the leg but the paper was too short the calf of the leg was as thick as a beam mind you don't make it too tight in the leg simon stitched on another strip of paper the gentleman twitched his toes about in a sock looking round at those in the hut and as he did so he noticed michael whom have you there asked he that is my workman he will sew the boots mind said the gentleman to michael remember to make them that they will last me for a year simon also looked at michael and saw that michael was not looking at the gentleman but was gazing into the corner behind the gentleman as if he saw someone there michael looked and looked 
and suddenly he smiled, and his face became brighter. What are you grinning at, you fool? thundered the gentleman. You had better look to it that the boots are ready in time. They shall be ready in good time, said Michael. Mind it is so, said the gentleman, and he put on his boots and his fur coat, wrapped the latter round him, and went to the door. But he forgot to stoop and struck his head against the lintel. He swore and rubbed his head. Then he took his seat in the carriage and drove away. When he had gone, Simon said, There is a figure of a man for you. You could not kill him with a mallet. He almost knocked out the lintel, but little harm it did him. And Matriona said, Living as he does, how should he not grow strong? Death itself can't touch such a rock as that. Then Simon said to Michael, Well, we have taken the work, but we must see we don't get into trouble over it. The leather is dear and the gentleman is hot-tempered. We must make no mistakes. Come, your eye is truer and your hands have become nibbler than mine. So you take this measure and cut out the boots. I'll finish off the sewing of the vamps. Michael did as he was told. He took the leather, spread it on the table, folded it into two, took a knife and began to cut out. Matryona came and watched him cutting, and was surprised to see how he was doing it. Matryona was accustomed to seeing boots made, and so she looked and saw that Michael was not cutting the leather for boots, but was cutting it round. She wished to say something, but she thought to herself, Perhaps I do not know how gentlemen's boots should be made. I suppose Michael knows more about it, and I won't interfere. When Michael had cut up the leather, he took a thread and began to sew, not with two ends, as boots are sewn, but with a single end, as for soft slippers. Again Matryona wondered, but again she did not interfere. Michael sewed on steadily till noon. Then Simon rose for dinner, looked round, and saw that Michael had made slippers out of the gentleman's leather. Ha! groaned Simon, and he thought, how is it that Michael, who has been with me a whole year and never made a mistake before, should do such a dreadful thing? The gentleman ordered high boots, welted, with whole friends, and Michael has made soft slippers with single soles, and has wasted the leather. What am I to say to the gentleman? I can never replace leather such as this. And he said to Michael, What are you doing, friend? You have ruined me. You know the gentleman ordered high boots, but see what you have made. Hardly had he began to rebuke Michael, when Ratat went the iron ring that hung at the door. Someone was knocking. They looked out of the window. A man had come on horseback and was fastening his horse. They opened the door and the servant who had been with the gentleman came in. Good day, said he. Good day, replied Simon. What can we do for you? My mistress has sent me about the boots. What about the boots? Why, my master no longer needs them. He is dead. Is it possible? He did not live to get home after leaving you, but died in the carriage. When we reached home and the servant came to help him alight, he rolled over like a sack. He was dead already, and so stiff that he could hardly be got out of the carriage. My mistress sent me here, saying, Tell the bootmaker that the gentleman who ordered boots of him and left the leather for them no longer needs the boots, but that he must quickly make soft slippers for the corpse. Wait till they are ready and bring them back with you. That is why I have come. Michael gathered the remnants of the leather, rolled them up, took the soft slippers he had made, slapped them together, wiped them down with his apron, and handed them and the roll of leather to the servant, who took them and said, Goodbye, masters, and good day to you. Another year passed, and another, and Michael was now living his sixth year with Simon. He lived as before. He went nowhere, only spoke when necessary, and had only smiled twice in all those years. Once when Matryona gave him food, and a second time when the gentleman was in their hut, Simon was more pleased with his workman. He never now asked him where he came from, 
and only feared lest Michael should go away. They were all at home one day. Matriona was putting iron pots in the oven. The children were running along the benches and looking out of the window. Simon was sewing at one window, and Michael was fastening on a heel at the other. One of the boys ran along the bench to Michael, leant on his shoulder, and looked out of the window. Look, Uncle Michael, there is a lady with little girls. She seems to be coming here, and one of the girls is lame. When the boy said that, Michael dropped his work, turned to the window, and looked out into the street. Simon was surprised. Michael never used to look out into the street, but now he pressed against the window, staring at something. Simon also looked out and saw that a well-dressed woman was really coming to his hut, leading by hand two little girls in fur coats and woolen shawls. The girls could hardly be told one from the other, except that one of them was crippled in her left leg and walked with a limp. The woman stepped into the porch and entered the passage. Feeling about for the entrance, she found the latch, which she lifted and opened the door. She let the two girls go in first and followed them into the hut. Good day, good folk. Pray come in, said Simon. What can we do for you? The woman sat down by the table. The two little girls pressed close to her knees, afraid of the people in the hut. I want leather shoes made for these two little girls for spring. We can do that. We never have made such small shoes, but we can make them, either welted or turnover shoes, linen lined. My man Michael is a master at work. Simon glanced at Michael and saw that he had left his work and was sitting with his eyes fixed on the little girls. Simon was surprised. It was true that the girls were pretty, with black eyes, plump and rosy cheeked, and they wore nice kerchiefs and fur coats. But still Simon could not understand why Michael should look at them like that, just as if he had known them before. He was puzzled, but went on talking with the woman and arranging the price. Having fixed it, he prepared the measure. The woman lifted the lame girl onto her lap and said, Take two measures from this little girl. Make one shoe for the lame foot and three for the sound one. They both have the same size feet. They are twins. Simon took the measure and, speaking of the lame girl, said, How did it happen to her? She is such a pretty girl. Was she born so? No, her mother crushed her leg. Then Matriona joined in. She wondered who this woman was and whose the children were. So she said, Are you not their mother then? No, my good woman. I am neither their mother nor any relation to them. They were quite strangers to me, but I adopted them. They are not your children, and yet you are so fond of them? How can I help being fond of them? I fed them both at my own breasts. I had a child of my own, but God took him. I was not so fond of him as I now am of them. Then whose children are they? The woman, having begun talking, told them the whole story. It was about six years ago. Their parents died, both in one week. Their father was buried on Tuesday, and their mother died on Friday. These orphans were born three days after their father's death, and their mother did not live another day. My husband and I were then living as peasants in the village. We were neighbors of theirs, our yard being next to theirs. Their father was a lonely man, a woodcutter in the forest. When felling trees one day, he let one fall on him. It fell across his body and crushed his bubbles out. They hardly got him home before his soul went to God. And that same week his wife gave birth to twins, these little girls. She was poor and alone. She had no one, young or old with her. Alone she gave them birth, and alone she met her death. The next morning I went to see her, but when I entered the hut, she, poor thing, was already stark and cold. In dying, she had rolled onto this child and crushed her leg. The village folk came to the hut, washed the body, laid her out, made a coffin and buried her. They were good folk. The babies were left alone. What was to be done with them? I was the only woman there who had a baby at the time. I was nursing my firstborn, eight weeks old. 
so i took them for a time the peasants came together and thought and thought what to do with them at last they said to me for the present mary you had better keep the girls and later on we will arrange what to do for them so i nursed the sound one at my breast but at first i did not feed the scribbled one i did not suppose she would live but then i thought to myself why should the poor innocent suffer i pitied her and began to feed her and so i fed my own boy and these two the three of them at my own breast i was young and strong and had good food and god gave me so much milk that at times it even overflowed i used sometimes to feed two at a time while the third was waiting when one had enough i nursed the third and god so ordered it that these grew up while my own was buried before he was two years old and i had no more children though we prospered now my husband is working for the corn merchant at the mill the pay is good and we are well off but i have no children of my own and how lonely i should be without these little girls how can i help loving them they are the joy of my life she pressed the lame little girl to her with one hand while the other she wiped the tears from her cheeks and matryona sighed and said the proverb is true that says one may live without father or mother but one cannot live without god so they talked together when suddenly the whole hut was lighted up as though by summer lightning from the corner where michael sat they all looked towards him and saw him sitting his hands folded on his knees gazing upwards and smiling the woman went away with the girls michael rose from the bench put down his work and took off his apron then bowing low to simon and his wife he said farewell masters god has forgiven me i ask your forgiveness too for anything done amiss and they saw that a light shone from michael and simon rose bowed down to michael and said i see michael that you are no common man and i can neither keep you nor question you one day tell me this how is it that when i found you and brought you home you were gloomy and when my wife gave you food you smiled at her and became brighter and then when the gentleman came to order boots you smiled again and became brighter still and now when this woman brought the little girls you smiled a third time and you have become as bright as day tell me michael why does your face shine so and why did you smile those three times and michael answered light shines from me because i have been punished but now god has pardoned me and i smiled three times because god sent me to learn three truths and i have learned them one i learned when your wife pitied me and that is why i smiled the first time the second i learned when the rich man ordered the boots and then i smiled again and now when i saw those little girls i learned the third and the last truth and i smiled the third time and simon said tell me michael what did god punish you for and what were the three truths that i too may know them and michael answered god punish me for disobeying him i was an angel in heaven and disobeyed god god sent me to fetch a woman's soul i flew to earth and saw a sick woman lying alone who had just given birth to twin girls they moved feebly at their mother's side but she could not lift them to her breast when she saw me she understood that god had sent me for her soul and she wept and said angel of god my husband has just been buried killed by a falling tree i have neither sister nor aunt nor mother no one to care for my orphans do not take my soul let me nurse my babes feed them and set them on their feet before i die children cannot live without father or mother and i hearkened to her i placed one child at her breast and gave the other into her arms and returned to the lord in heaven i flew to the lord and said i could not take the soul of the mother her husband was killed by a tree the woman has twins and prays that her soul may not be taken she says let me nurse and feed my children and set them on their feet children cannot live without father or mother i have not taken her soul and god said go take the mother's soul and learn three truths 
learn what wells in man what is not given to man and what men live by when thou hast learned these things thou shalt return to heaven so i flew again to earth and took the mother's soul the babes dropped from our breasts her body rolled over on the bed and crushed one babe twisting its leg i rose above the village wishing to take her soul to god but a wind seized me and my wings drooped and dropped off her soul rose alone to god while i fell to the earth by the road side and simon and matryona understood who it was that lived with them and whom they had clothed and fed and they wept with awe and with joy and the angel said i was alone in the field naked i had never known human needs cold and hunger till i became a man i was famished frozen and did not know what to do i saw near the field i was in a shrine built for god and i went to it hoping to find shelter but the shrine was locked and i could not enter so i sat on behind the shrine to shelter myself at least from the wind evening drew on i was hungry frozen and in pain suddenly i heard a man coming along the road he carried a pair of boots and was talking to himself for the first time since i became a man i saw the mortal face of a man and his face seemed terrible to me and i turned from it and i heard the man talking to himself of how to cover his body from the cold in the winter and how to feed his wife and children and i thought i am perishing of cold and hunger and here is a man thinking only of how to clothe himself and his wife and how to get bread for themselves he cannot help me when the man saw me he frowned and became still more terrible and passed me by on the other side i despaired but suddenly i heard him coming back i looked up and did not recognize the same man before i had seen death in his face but now he was alive and i recognized in him the presence of god he came up to me clothed me and took me with him and brought me to his home i entered the house a woman came to meet us and began to speak the woman was still more terrible than the man had been the spirit of death came from her mouth i could not breathe for the stench of death that spread round her she wished to drive me out into the cold and i knew that if she did so she would die suddenly her husband spoke to her of god and the woman changed at once and when she brought me food and looked at me i glanced at her and saw that death no longer dwelt in her she had become alive and in her too i saw god then i remembered the first lesson god had set me learn what dwells in man and i understood that in man dwells love i was glad that god had already begun to show me what he had promised and i had smiled for the first time but i had not yet learnt all i did not yet know what is not given to man and what men live by i lived with you and a year passed a man came to order boots that should wear for a year without losing shape or cracking i looked at him and suddenly behind his shoulder i saw my comrade the angel of death none but me saw that angel but i knew him and knew that before the sun set he would take the rich man's soul and i thought to myself the man is making preparations for a year and does not know that he will die before evening and i remembered god's second saying learn what is not given to man what wells in man i already knew now i learnt what is not given to him it is not given to man to know his own needs and i smiled for the second time i was glad to have seen my comrade angel glad also that god had revealed to me the second saying but i still did not know all i did not know what men live by and i lived on waiting till god should reveal to me the last lesson in the sixth year came the girl twins with the woman and i recognized the girls and heard how they had been kept alive having heard the story i thought their mother besought me for the children's sake and i believed her when she said that children cannot live without father or mother but a stranger has nursed them and brought them up and when the woman showed her love for the children that were not her own and wept for them i saw in her the living god and understood what men live by and i knew that god had revealed to me the last lesson 
and had forgiven my sin and then i smiled for the third time and the angel's body was bad and he was clothed in light so that i could not look at him and his voice grew louder as though it came not from him but from the heaven above and the angel said i have learned that all men live not by care for themselves but by love it was not given to the mother to know what her children needed for their life nor was it given to the rich man to know what he himself needed nor is it given to any man to know whether when evening comes he will need boots for his body or slippers for his corpse i remained alive when i was a man not by care of myself but because love was present in a passer by and because he and his wife pitied and loved me the orphans remained alive not because of their mother's care but because there was love in the heart of a woman a stranger to them who pitied and loved them and all men live not by the thought they spend on their own welfare but because love exists in man i knew before that god gave life to men and desires that they should live now i understand more than that i understand that god does not wish men to live apart and therefore he does not reveal to them what each one needs for himself but he wishes them to live united and therefore reveals to each of them what is necessary for all i have now understood that though it seems to men that they live by care for themselves in truth it is love alone by which they live he who has love is in god and god is in him for god is love and the angel sang praise to god so that the hut trembled at his voice the roof opened and a column of fire rose from earth to heaven simon and his wife and children fell to the ground wings appeared upon the angel's shoulders and he rose into heavens and when simon came to himself the hut stood as before and there was no one in it but his own family end of chapter 1 read by lambda